Mitch Daniels is the 12th president of Purdue University, former governor of Indiana, also an executive at Eli Lilly. And since joining Purdue, President Daniels has introduced a series of innovative initiatives called Purdue Moves that provide some answers, some solutions to some of the challenges that are facing education today. So welcome, uh, Mitch Daniels. Great to meet you. And I'm so happy to be interviewing my alma mater president. <laughs> thank you, Jane. Great. And please, please know how proud Purdue University is of you. Oh, thank you so much. So and I love saying that I went to Purdue. So first, let's talk about uh, the tuition that you have been able to do at Purdue, to which is unheard of, I think, in higher education. You've kept tuition frozen for what, 10, 11 years now? How were you able to do that? By prioritizing it uh, and uh, deciding that student affordability, accessibility uh, to higher ed, which was why land grant schools like Purdue were created in the first place, um, uh, is uh, uh, really our top assignment. And uh, sometimes I say we solve the equation for zero. We simply ask ourselves, as, as you would in any enterprise, I think, in business, what matters most and what do we have to do to produce that result? But um, I, I'll confess that when we started, I had no idea we'd be able to continue as we have, but next year will be the 11th year with no change in tuition or fees. Room and board is less expensive than it was. So in nominal, that is unadjusted dollars, it'll be less expensive to attend our university next year than it was in 2012. Hmm. And there aren't too many things in the marketplace for which that's true. No, not at all. Um, and as a parent of a 12 and 14 year old, I can talk about how appreciative I am of that, but you've been able to do that. Now, let's just talk about some of the research and things that are going on at Purdue. There's some hypersonic research. Of course, space has always been um, well known at Purdue. So talk to me about some of those innovative things that are going on there. Purdue has been uh, for a very long time, uh, what we now call a STEM oriented school, but never more so than today. About two thirds of our students are studying one or another of the STEM disciplines and our research tracks with that. We're, we, uh, here too, we've, we've tried to make choices. You can't be the world's best at everything, but we believe we are the world's best or among them in certain areas. Uh, plant science, what we now call precision agriculture, ways to grow more food for a hungry world and do so more sustainably. Uh, we've made big investments there and uh, I think we're probably the, the equal of anyone. Uh, on the uh, uh, aerospace side, there's a huge history. We are the, uh, known as the cradle of astronauts. More uh, have graduated here than else anywhere else. That's indicative of a long time commitment from Amelia Earhart in the 30s to Neil Armstrong in the 60s to today. Um, we our, our people have been at the forefront, uh, which today, and you mentioned hypersonics, this nation needs to catch up. It's one of the, it's the first time in my experience that we've been uh, perhaps uh, dangerously behind in the in technology uh, uh, that is uh, maybe central to the national security. And so we, uh, we're we probably doing more of that than, than any other school I know. Mm -hmm. And you've also got companies like Saab and, and Schweitzer and Engineering that are locating in West Lafayette, right, to take advantage of the, the brain power there, the low cost. Indiana, of course, very tax friendly state. Yes, um, it, it was obvious to me, it, it, certainly way back in my last job, that no state can have a better asset in an information intensive world and economy, a knowledge economy of today than a a premier research and STEM oriented university. And the chance to make of our school, not just a great place for teaching, learning and research, but an economic magnet was so obvious. And that's happening and it's very symbiotic in our view uh, or synergistic maybe with our mission. Uh, these companies that are populating our innovation district on the border of our campus are uh, uh, serving as sources of research for our faculty, internships and permanent jobs for our students. And we believe we're serving their business interests in a way that they can't find elsewhere. Uh, so uh, uh, this is very uh, central objective of ours. We've, we've uh, effected a, I think, unique in the nation partnership with our local community to build the infrastructure that makes all this more attractive. And, and yes, Indiana is a top five business state. The, 
and I hope and uh, that uh, that that doesn't hurt in, as we make these uh, approaches. That's right. And I, I was there for homecoming last fall. So out by Purdue West, there was all this new housing, the intramural fields. I mean, is that kind of part of the grand plan so that people can live and work on campus? And I mean, how does that fit into the whole ecosystem? Yes. There, it, it, uh, some other places have, have uh, in, we didn't create the concept of the innovation district. There's some very successful ones elsewhere. They tend to be in urban environments where it's maybe a little easier to do. We wanted to build one here for the reasons I already gave, and then quite selfishly, so that uh, 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 this area becomes a more and more attractive place. You know, by the way, we're, we're attracting with some, minor, with some minor incentives, a lot of remote workers now who are coming individually. So not as opposed to a company like Saab building a big facility that we still are um, recruiting those, but uh, individuals can, you, you can find a, a uh, a, a lot worse living environment than to be uh, in a university community sure. with the intellectual, cultural, recreational um, uh, features that a school like this provides. So that's that's in our interest because we've got to keep attracting the best minds in the world to come here and and uh, teach our students and yeah. and uh, research for the next discovery. And finally, just again, talk to me a little bit about how you see education. I'm sure the pandemic kind of accelerated some trends that were already kind of happening in terms of remote, online classes. I mean, where do you see things going? Virtual reality, I think, is going to be a big part of education in the future. That's all exactly right. Uh, education, higher education at least, probably lends itself as well to remote and hybrid work as most other enterprises. Uh, at, at present, I don't know, this may settle out in a slightly different place, but at present, uh, a quarter of our faculty and staff are working remotely all the time. And um, another third are working in the so-called hybrid mode. Um, that will probably be a permanent feature. And that's not necessarily bad at all. Um, it, has, it has many uh, advantages. And uh, for now, we've not seen any diminution in, in productivity, but, um, uh, you know, education has simply got the move. It's it's very interesting. We win awards here for innovation and so forth. And I always laugh a little because I don't consider these things particularly uh, uh, imaginative. It's just that higher ed, which likes to fancy itself, very you know progressive, is really a very reactionary place. They, they don't change anything until they have to. They better get busy because... Uh, the number of students who are finding a four-year experience worth the money um, and better than other alternatives has flattened. And um, we're going to need to offer not only a rigorous, high-quality, high-value experience, we believe, but one that has more work experience than it's had before, um, more uh, 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 hands-on learning of the kind that is uh, – unquestionably valuable in the marketplace. And yes, we are going to have to use tools and are developing some fascinating ones here uh, to use augmented reality, um, AI, and yeah. and so forth to uh, to do that more productively and, uh, and creatively. Well, and it certainly feels like education is kind of ripe for di disruption. Right now, you mentioned, uh, you know, or people are questioning the value and, um, and it does feel like we're going to, the education is going to look a lot different in the next generation than it has over the past 20 years or so. Would you agree? I do. It's people have been saying this and forecasting it for quite some time, but this, uh, this would not, this would hardly be the first time when people correctly identified a trend may have overestimated the speed with which it would arrive, but uh, doesn't mean it won't come and perhaps go even further than they thought at the, at the outset. And, um, we have seen the 70 schools go out of business over the last five years. And uh, given the demographic challenges of fewer 18 year olds, um, the, uh, a, lar a large part of the future, frankly, will be in, the, uh, in bringing higher education, maybe not full degrees, but more education to those that much larger number of adults who either didn't finish or didn't even attempt higher ed the first time. You know, here we, uh, have moved into what I believe is the third circle of of uh, higher education, which is uh, we operate Purdue Global now. It has about as many students as we have here on campus. 
about 35,000 students, but they're completely different. They're, they are adults who are seeking to better themselves by achieving a degree or maybe just a, a, a credential in IT or health care or education or business that uh, uh, we can provide them online. And um, uh, uh, undoubtedly, this will be a much bigger part of the, of the uh, overall American uh, future. Yeah, well, it certainly feels like education is going to be a lifelong thing. It already was, but even more so now. So thank you so much, Mitch Daniels, for joining me. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you and meet you. And um, we'll meet in West Lafayette sometime in person. Pleasure's all mine, Jane. Boiler up. Thank you.